Crossing family, it is so good to be with each and every single one of you. I am glad that you are with us this weekend. I don't care where you're joining from, whether you're joining from here at 48th Street, one of our locations, online or inside, we just want you to know God loves you, this church loves you, and we believe that every single one of you can have an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Back by popular demand. After last week's incredible messages is our friend, Dr. Wes Beavis. So would you put your hands together and welcome him to the stage. One more time, my man. Well, it's awesome to be at The Crossing. And uh, my name is Dr. Wes Beavis. I am a clinical psychologist, but more importantly than that, I am a Jesus follower. I'm a living example to the fact that you do not need to choose between faith and science. In fact, that is something that culture is trying to convince you, that if you uh, believe in God, then you're anti-science, and that is not the truth at all. And uh, I'm going to be sharing with you today some great things in the context of uh, what has already been shared in the Weeds in My Garden series on mental health. The last message I gave really drove into you the fact that God has wonderfully made us with all types of neurochemicals, all types of hormones in our system that can work towards us having good mental health. And it's up to us. We're not at the mercy of those chemicals. We actually have control over those chemicals. If you didn't watch the message, go back and have a watch of it. It will encourage you. But today, I want to go real practical on you. And uh, can you say the number five? five? I want you to say it three times in a row. Five, five, five. Today, I have three sections. Each section has five points. And the way this is going to roll out is the first section of five points is going to happen very quickly. It's like a sandwich. We're going to burn through that side of the sandwich very quickly. And that the back end section is five points, going to burn through that quickly. The meat is in the middle. So let me start with the first section here. How to become more anxious and depressed. Five guaranteed ways that you can become more anxious and depressed. Well, some of you might be here thinking, you know, I'm kind of effervescing with too much joy at the moment. And I need, I need a little more depression, a little more anxiety in my life. And if that's you, you're in the right place because I have five guaranteed ways to induce more depression and anxiety in your life. Number one, when you are feeling down, isolate yourself from others and avoid the great outdoors. At all costs, make sure you're by yourself with your own thoughts. At all costs, do not go in the great outdoors, and for goodness sake, do not allow any sunshine onto your skin, because what that will do, that will stimulate certain neurochemical responses in your body and make you feel good, and you don't want to feel good, so make sure that when you are feeling down, you isolate yourself, because social Uh, interaction elevates our mood, and we don't want our mood to be elevated, and being in the great outdoors will elevate our mood as well, and we we don't want that to happen if our goal is for you to become more anxious and depressed. Number two, spend as much time as you can being sedentary. Just lie around. Do not exercise. Exercise will release a lot of feel-good chemicals in you, and it's very good for your mental health. But if you want to increase depression and anxiety, be sedentary. Lay around. Be be in in a static state. Number three. See, I told you we're going to fly through these. Eat more UPFs. You're going, Dr. West, what is a UPF? It is an ultra-processed food. And our culture and our society is... Full of it, absolutely. Lots of ultra-processed foods that give you the sense that you're being nourished because you're eating, you're chewing, you're swallowing. But in effect, these ultra-processed foods offer very little nutritional benefit. In fact, they will do the opposite. They can inflame your system, which contributes to your negative mental states. So if you want to increase depression and anxiety in your life, make sure you hit the ultra-processed foods Ice cream and dark chocolate is my 
preferences here. And so I have to keep them under good management because they do have an effect on my mental health. Number four, cooperate with whatever your depression or anxiety is telling you. Because what we've discovered in the social sciences is this, whatever you concentrate on, whatever you focus on, whatever you cooperate with, you get more depression. So if you cooperate with whatever your depressed feelings are telling you, then you're just going to attract more reasons to be depressed. Anxiety and, uh, and uh, social anxiety, all that. If you just cooperate with what your feelings are telling you, you're going to get more of uh, the depressed and anxious states. And number five, let your current disappointment shape your view of God. Because when we're disappointed, when we are discouraged, we tend to be in a place in our brain which is not as sophisticated as uh, the prefrontal cortex. And when we are discouraged and we tend to make um, uh, value judgments of, about our life, about our world in which we live and about our future, they're not the best value judgments. And we can make judgments of God that are so inaccurate when we are depressed, discouraged, and anxious. So, but if you want more of those things in your life, then yes, let your current disappointment influence your view of God. But I think I'm talking to people here who actually do not want to elevate depression, anxiety, or any other challenging mental states in your life. So we're heading into section two. Can you say five? five. Fantastic. Section two is proven mental health practices for you. Let's get into it. Number one, build muscle. Build muscle. And I'm not talking about build spiritual muscle. I'm not talking in a, in a metaphorical sense. I am talking about build muscle. We're talking biceps, triceps, calf muscles, any mu your glutes. And it, build muscle. Okay, here's some scripture here. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. See, we're all, we've already dealt with the metaphorical in the sense, love the God, God with all your heart. Metaphorically speaking, it's like the very core of your body. Love the Lord with the, the very core of who you are. Your soul. What, what existed before your human body, which will exist after your human body. And with your mind. And it also goes on to say strength. Love the Lord your God with your strength. Another Bible passage here, for while body, bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Now, this is a trap that I've fallen into, and a lot of believers, a lot of followers of Jesus fall into this trap because we read, for our bodily training is of some value, godliness is of a much greater value. And what we tend to do is go, I'm just going to go with the godliness. I want to be strong in godliness. I, want to be, I, 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 I just want to be good in godliness. And we forget the fact that the Bible says, Bodily training is of some value. And we tend to live in the, in the sense that, well, you know, bodily training is of no value. And I particularly believe that as followers of Jesus, we should have the best bodies. If we're loving the Lord, our God, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, there is value in bodily training. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You know, sometimes, and I'm being guilty of this in my life, is that I actually ignore my body in pursuit of the higher things of the kingdom. In fact, I sacrifice my body for ministry. And while that sounds very noble at a surface level, we actually get to choose what type of body we're going to offer to God as a living sacrifice. Now, I remember when I was planting a church, I got caught up in 
anxiety, in depression. Things weren't working out as I was hoping of my lofty goals and my noble desires. And so I gained 50 pounds. And uh, in a sense, I was working really hard for Jesus, really hard for the church. But I was sacrificing my body. And I was presenting my body as a living sacrifice, but it wasn't the best version of my body. And I think as followers of Jesus, we, we have that option. I'm going to offer my body as a living sacrifice. But what version of your body are you offering as a living sacrifice? Now, some of you are sitting there, and understandably so, going, Dr. Wes, I, you, know, you seem to be giving a message on physical fitness. What does this have to do with mental health? I will tell you what it has to do with mental health. Building muscle is associated, this is scientifically proven data, mental, uh, building muscle is associated with improved mental clarity, improved cognitive processing, improved mental function as you age. And let me, let me the, the things I'm talking about here is like build muscle now because there's going to come a time where we will enter our marginal decade. And you're asking, well, what's the marginal decade. The marginal decade is the decade that we all have in common. It's the last decade of our life. And every one of us in this room will enter their marginal decade at some point. Now, the marginal decade is called this because at that time it's when we struggle the most with physical health issues. People in their marginal decades see the doctors more, are in and out of the hospital more, are struggling more with issues of mobility and uh, the capacity to uh, be independent in their living. And so while I say build muscle, it is playing into your future mental health. Because it's, if you've known what it is to be active and independent and having the energy to give for all your previous decades and then you enter a decade when you, you're struggling to get out of a chair, that is depressing and that is anxiety producing. And so I'm here to say building muscle has a lot to do with your mental health, not only now, but in the future. Um, Stressing muscle, that's when you put you know, a dumbbell, some weights, whatever, putting, putting your muscle under stress so it has to strain, releases endorphins. That's a, a chemical that God has put in our body for a specific purpose. Endorphins elevate mood. Endorphins are a natural analgesic, that means a painkiller. Endorphins soothe the anxious brain and increase an optimistic outlook on life. And if you don't believe me, go and, and subject yourself to an exercise ex experience. Either go to the gym, go for a walk, go for, do something. And I can pretty well guarantee you that after, not during, I mean, when I'm at the gym, I'm going, oh my goodness, why am I doing this? This is so, I'm not enjoying this. But afterwards, I feel great. I experience the, the elevated mood. You, you experience the mental clarity. You experience so many things. A soothing of the anxious brain. I mean, if you're feeling anxiety in your life, put some, put some muscle training into your world and you will experience your anxiety levels decreasing. Uh, muscle is the number one organ of long longevity. You know, a lot of press is given to the heart muscle because, you know, understandably, the, uh, uh, most deaths in America occur as a result of cardiac problems, followed by cancer. But ultimately, it's, it's the muscle atrophy or sarcopenia which ends up taking us out. Because if we cannot be mobile, then we're going to be more sedentary. And our muscles will continue to atrophy if we can't get up and be mobile, if we can't move, if we're going to struggle, if we're going to have aches and pains, uh, that's going to further increase our propensity to be immobile and sedentary, and that's going to affect our mental health. What I'm saying is, be like the Queen of England, who two days 
Two days before she died of natural causes, she was installing the new prime minister of England, commissioning that next uh, uh, reign of leadership presiding over the country. Isn't that what you want? I know that's what I want. I want right up to two days before the good Lord takes me home. I am still officiating in ministry and doing powerful things in ministry and having influence in ministry. So starting in your 40s, you start to lose 1% of your muscle mass each year. And that corresponds with a 1% to 3% loss in strength. So if you don't do anything to counteract your uh, muscle atrophy, the sarcopenia, if you start to register higher and higher on the frailty index, then that is going to cause you to become more depressed because you think, you're going to think, wow, I could, you know, I used to be able to pick up my grandchild and swing them around and I, I'm finding it really difficult to even lift them up. And it's not because they're growing up more. It's just I'm losing my strength. And so you can counteract that. If you decide, what version of my body am I going to offer as a living sacrifice? And some of you are thinking, well, you know, Dr. West, you know, I haven't really been active in my life uh, too much up to now. I wouldn't, you know, I feel very uncomfortable in, on the inside of a gym. I understand that. But it's never too late to reverse it. I, uh, I have a conflicted relationship with running and, uh, uh, but I decided at the age of 55, I was going to run my first marathon. And, and I was able to do that. And I've run several marathons since. The last, okay, okay, before, before you applaud me, before you applaud me, the last marathon I ran, I was beat. I was beat by 45 minutes by a guy who was 83. I'm telling you. What the human body is capable of, the way God has designed us with the resiliency factors, you know, we, I think we tend to give in to uh, the process of aging unnecessarily. Okay, so a couple of tips. Do it when your willpower is strongest. That means do it first thing in the morning because as the day grinds on, you're going to be losing psychological uh, um, fuel as the day gets on. So uh, as Brian Tracy, that great sales trainer, said, if in the context of your day you have to eat a frog, eat the frog first. And so um, I would encourage you to try and put it in quick. And of course, because I'm a doctor of clinical psychology, I work with what's happening in the brain and the emotions and the behavior. I am not a medical doctor, although my son is. Check with your medical doctor. That's my disclaimer because I don't want you to sue me. All right. Number two, good sleep hygiene. Great scripture for this. Then he got into the boat, that's Jesus, and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up upon the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. They were full of anxiety at this point. Jesus replied, you of little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. But implied in that context is this very important principle for us. You face storms better when you are not sleep deprived. So get good at sleep. Sleep medication is not the answer. There are lots of components that go into sleep hygiene. I won't take you through it now, but I am going to tell you that when you are sleep deprived, it's so easy to, uh, to get into negative mental states. Uh, in, sleep deprivation increases cortisol, which is a stress hormone in your body, and uh, it makes you hungrier for all the wrong foods. I'm talking salty, crunchy, and sweet. When you have had a lot of cortisol running through your system, you are driven to just, they call comfort foods for a reason. So, uh, and your body repairs when you sleep. You see, we spend the entirety of our day inflaming our body, you know, subjecting our body to stress, and some of that is, is positive stress. 
You know, going to the gym is positive stress, but we inflame our body, every organ of our body, including our brain. And when we're sleeping, that's when God does his powerful work of repairing all the the result of us stressing the body. You don't build muscles in the gym. You build your muscles. Well, let me say, say that. Your muscles don't grow in the gym. Your muscles actually get torn in the gym. It's when you sleep that your muscles start to rebuild. All right. Number three, evaluate sugar intake. Now, I'm not going to stand here and say, you know, cut out all sugar. You know, I'd be a hypocrite if I said that. You know, I love sugar. Sugar and I have a, have a we have an interesting relationship. I am, uh, I, I am a recovering sugar addict. Um, The Bible says this about sugar. It says, it is not good to eat too much honey. That's it. The the Bible doesn't talk about high glycemic carbohydrates, donuts, bagels. It it just talks about it's not good to eat too much honey. That's because sugar has an interesting effect on your body. Your brain needs a certain amount of it, but we tend to really overdo it. If you want more depression and anxiety in your life, eat more sugar. It'll help you get there. Uh, Sugar has been associated with elevated levels of depression and anxiety. So if you ever find yourself in an anxious state or a depressed state, just check check your sugar intake. And here's why. Um, It causes inflammation in your body, including your brain. And sometimes depression and anxiety is the brain's way of saying, I'm inflamed. Did you know in the 1700s, the average intake of sugar per person per day was one teaspoon in the 1700s? Because they didn't have all the high refined carbohydrates, um, foods that register high on the uh, high glycemic index then. Today... 2018, a couple of years old, but I think we've probably only gotten worse. Men take in an average of 19 teaspoons a day, and women, 15 teaspoons per day. And there's a reason for that. Sugar is number one, it's highly addictive, and every food company knows it, so they try to inject as much sugar into foods because they want you to keep coming back for more. And so sugar is in everything, especially your ultra-processed foods. So the more sugar, uh, oh, here's a fun fact, and and try this out for an experiment. The more sugar you eat, the more you will crave sugar. It causes a dopaminergic reaction in your brain. And uh, brain is that, uh, dopamine is that great feel-good chemical, and we we love it when we get it. So evaluate your sugar intake. I'm not saying, you know, get rid of all sugar. I'm not going to be that mean. I'm just going to say, think about it. All right. Uh, Proactively vacate. That's a fancy word for make sure you get some vacations. And vacation is based on the word of vacate the the life that you're normally embroiled in. Now, here's here's what we think. Culture thinks that vacation, the recovery happens when you're at the destination. And sure, you get maximum beneficial effect when you're on vacation. And we think that, that after we come home from vacation, the, the residual benefits of that uh, go on for uh, several weeks, maybe several months. It's not the truth. Scientific research says that uh, we overestimate the benefits of post-vacation time, and we underestimate the benefits on pre-vacation time. This is actually how it looks. You start to get the beneficial effect of a vacation from the moment you book it. So if you book it to go away on a vacation in three months' time, you start to get the benefits of it. You just have that sense of anticipation. You're looking forward to it. You're subconsciously preparing for it. And so that you don't feel guilty after you come back from vacation. Generally, the drop-off is very steep, leading to that thought of, oh my goodness, I feel so guilty. I was just on vacation last week, but it doesn't feel like I went away on vacation at all. Has anybody ever felt that? You know, and, and some of us even come back from a vacation needing a vacation. So uh, you've got to think about what type of vacation you take. Um, all right, number five, pay to see a trained Christian clinician or a counselor. Now, I put cl- Christian in there because in the, in the behavioral sciences, 
psychologists, uh, marriage and family therapists, licensed clinical social workers. Um, they're not representative of the larger cultural context. Uh, generally, only, uh, not generally, specifically, they did research on this, only 40% of psychologists are uh, people of faith. And yet we have, you know, 70 or 80% of the population at large that, are, uh, that believe in God. So why I say go to a Christian clinician is your faith is an important tool in your toolbox that a clinician can use. So if you go to a, a, a clinician who doesn't understand faith, that's a big tool in, in your toolbox that they can't use because they don't know how to use it. So I would encourage you, uh, go to see a Christian clinician. And why do I say pay? Because it's human nature. You are more vested in that which you pay for. You've got to have skin in the game. If somebody else is paying for it, yeah, you'll go and, and have a lovely chat. But you're not going to be as motivated as somebody who's putting money into this process. So, the uh, Bible says here in Proverbs, Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in, the wis walks in wisdom will be delivered. See, when we're in anxious or depressed or burnt out mental states, we are not operating out of the best part of our brain. And so, I love this saying that I, I use often in therapy. It's, it's hard to read the label when you're stuck inside the bottle. And that's why it's good to go and see somebody. Because as smart as you are, as, as solid as you are in your faith, sometimes you're so stuck in your situation, it's hard to see what's going on. All right. All um, right. That's my son there. He is uh, a doctor of medicine in the U.S. Navy. Uh, when he was going through uh, uh, pre-med, he played rugby, and he broke his arm. Called me up, Dad, going to the hospital. I've broken my arm. <laughs> Ellie and I go to the hospital. Uh, the orthopedic surgeon comes into the room, and sure, I mean, that was really busted. You could see it. It was like, ooh. And the uh, orthopedic surgeon threw some, uh, his x-ray up on the light box, and he said, okay, this is what we've got. It's definitely broken. There are three options here. Number one, we could just leave it alone. The bones will eventually, that's the wonder of the human body, the, the bones, the broken ends will eventually find themselves and they'll fuse back together. The problem with that is it'll be very painful, it'll take a long time to heal, and the bones will probably heal in a way that's problematic over a long distance of time. I said, okay, what's the second object? We can, we can apply traction. We can pull the bones apart and try to get them in line as much as we can and then um, put plaster in. It'll be less painful. It'll, you'll heal quicker, and, uh, and it won't be so uh, prone to problems down the line. And I said, well, what's the third option? And he said, well, I can go in. I can open him up. I can put a titanium plate and some screws in there. I can get the bones exactly in alignment, and it'll heal the fastest of all. It'll be the least amount of pain, and you'll have the least amount of problems going forward. And that is, why, that is what therapy is like. It's going to a doctor, going to a licensed clinician. They can help you uh, uh, heal faster, be less uh, pain involved, and heal in a way that's not problematic in, uh, in future years. And the other thing is you won't burn out your friends. Let your friends be your friends. Do all your deep work with your therapist. Okay, so that's the meat in the middle. Build muscle, good sleep hygiene, evaluate sugar intake, proactively vacate, and pay to see a trained clinician or counselor. So that is five practical steps that we could, because the weeds in our garden, once we pull those weeds out, we've got to replace them with good behaviors. And so I've just given you five. Okay, the last section, everybody say five. five. All right, is how you can help others. The Bible says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So, number one, normalize mental health experience. And I've watched every message in this Weeds in My Garden series that you've done. And I want to tell you that your pastor, uh, Clayton Hensel, has done an amazing job. He has well-researched what he has taught you. 
and he's talked about the fact that we want to men- normalize it. Everybody, it doesn't matter how, how strong and how capable you are as a leader, everybody will struggle from time to time with something that's broken in their lives. So let's just normalize it. Number two, invite them to go for a sunshine walk. Remember Elijah when he was severely depressed after his high experience of Mount Carmel, where that amazing miracle happened. You know, a lot of adrenaline, a lot of cortisol through the system. And what happens often when you go through an experience like that, you can have a post-project, post-experience slump. Well, where did he find himself? At the, in the back of a cave. No sunlight, no fresh air. So one of the most beneficial things you can do with somebody who's struggling is say, hey, come for a walk with me and get into the sunshine. Number three, help them formulate a personal crisis plan. Now, every year I have to do continuing education to keep up my license as a clinical psychologist. And so I do training with an organization that uh, works with the Navy SEALs in San Diego. And there is a higher rate of of suicide that happens with uh, people in the armed forces. And so they're very keenly aware of what uh, to do. And what they train their clinicians to do is when when their patients are in a good place, put together a crisis plan, a a personal crisis plan, while their head's in, in a good place, so that when they are struggling, they don't have to rely upon their thinking, because when you're struggling, you're not operating out of the best part of your brain. And so at that point, you don't trust your thinking, you take out your crisis, personal crisis plan, and you just do what's on the list. Call a friend, Get in the outdoors, go for a walk, go to the gym, and you don't, don't trust what your brain is thinking, trust what your cri- personal crisis plan that you established when things were well and established with somebody else, and work the plan. Don't, don't be led by your feelings, but work the plan. So help, uh, help people by getting them to have a crisis, uh, personal crisis plan uh, ahead of time. Number four, encourage ministry and mission involvement. Because sometimes our mental health challenges are because we're spending too much time in our own heads, thinking about our own problems. And that's why I love The Crossing, is that you are so committed to missions and ministry. You provide lots of opportunity for people to get outside of their own heads. And number five, nudge them towards Jesus Jesus Christ is the solution to every dilemma faced by man, woman, and child. And so we do the best thing by nudging people towards Jesus. Because sometimes when you get into that place of struggle, you you start to doubt whether God loves you. You start to doubt whether God is for you. Thoughts like, yeah, God is so, so busy blessing Clayton Hensel and Jerry Harris that he hasn't got time for me. Well, that's not reality. That's a lie that comes not from heaven. And so sometimes people just need to be nudged back in the direction of Jesus. Sometimes, it need, sometimes people need a shove, depending upon their temperament, temperament you know, whether it's a shove or a nudge. But lead people back to Jesus. Right now, we're moving in to a time of decision. That's actually where I want to begin this invitation time. For those of you in this room or you're you're watching online, I want to begin with a nudge. And just so you know, if you don't know who I am, I am not opposed to a shove. Like, I will shove you. And the reason I will shove you because I care about you, because I love you too much, that if you came into this room and you've been, you're looking for ways to try to figure out life and the mess that you're walking in, and you're just like, man, I'm so thankful they just gave me all these practical ways to do all these things, but if you don't hear this, you got to start with Jesus. you got to start inside of that intimate personal relationship with him, and I know just because I know this church and I know uh, the people who walk in here or who are watching online, there are some of you, you have, not, you have not made that decision to follow him. You have not surrendered your life to him. 
You're just like, man, I got this building muscle thing. I can go to the gym. I can eat better. I don't think I can lower my sugar intake. I can't do that one, but I can, I can do all these things. Listen, all those things are really, really good and very helpful. And it's a very important step in your mental health. But it all goes on the foundation of knowing who Jesus is and, and applying that to your life and making him Lord and Savior of your life. And so listen, if you're not there, I would love to come alongside of you. I would love to have a conversation with you in just a little bit. When the music starts and we start singing, you may feel a nudge on your heart to respond, to, to get up. And I would tell you, that's not me. That's not the person next to you. That's the Holy Spirit saying, it's your time. Get up. Respond. Move. Come to me. I invite you, I, I want you to, to know me as your Lord and your Savior. You are valued, you are loved, you are mine. I would encourage you, respond to that moment. Come talk to me and you're like, hey, I, I felt the Holy Spirit, I felt this nudge, I felt this shove. And let's take that step to make Jesus Lord and Savior of life. And tonight may be that night where you get in that water and you declare Jesus Lord and Savior. It'll be the best decision you can ever make. It's how you build all the rest of the decisions that you're going to make in your life. You base it off of that. Jesus is your firm foundation. So move tonight in just a little bit. Get out of your seat. Get out of your comfort zone. For those of you in this room, you are Christians. You've made that decision. You felt that nudge. You responded. You're walking in it. Here you are. I wonder, just like I was trying to discern, what hit you in that message? What action do you feel like you may need to take? What area are you lacking in? What, what area do you not have good clarity in? In just a little bit, we're going to have the time where, where you know, if you come here every single week, these steps are open, and you are invited to come forward. But I want you to know this, that we have a mission Outside of knowing and loving Jesus, our mission is to make uh, that known to the world, to share our faith, to let the people around us in our workplaces, in our, in our schools, or wherever you may be, whatever environment you may find yourself in, that they are loved by Jesus. And you can't do that when you're not taking care of yourself. So I don't know what of those five practical ways that maybe you need to respond to. Maybe it is changing your diet. Maybe it is getting up and walking a little bit more into the sunlight. Maybe it is sleeping just a little bit more or a little better. But I would just encourage you, man, if you don't know what it is still, come up to the steps and just say, God, speak to me. Help me. Make a decision. Listen, he said move. The very best movement you could do is just get up out of your seats. Get out of, in front of your chairs. Walk to the steps and get into the very best position as a Christian you could possibly get into. And that is a humbled position before the Lord. And just say, here I am. Use me as a living, my body is a living sacrifice. I want to turn this over to you and use me because I have a mission. This mission is not just for me as a pastor. It's not just for our staff. It is your mission to carry the gospel, the good news to this world. And you need to be well to do it. So I don't know what your step is, but here's what I want to encourage you. When the music starts, and you hear this every single week, and you may be like, yeah, Corey, you're talking to that person over there. You're talking to my wife. She needs to get up. She needs to go to the steps. I'm talking to all of us. Let's take a step of faith tonight. Let's take a step of humility tonight. Let's get on our knees and do business with the Lord. Would you guys stand with me as you consider that? Heavenly Father. God, I give you thanks and praise that we come to this moment every single week. God, I pray that we don't take it for granted. I pray that we don't ever take this moment for granted. A, a chance to respond, a chance to move, a chance to connect with you in a real and personal and intimate way. God, I pray for every single person in here who's going through a battle. I pray, Lord, the way that we go into battle is with your strength and not our own. Father, I pray for those people in this room or watching online that is not following you, has not surrendered life to you. God, I pray that you just give them that nudge right now to respond, to move, and to turn their life to you, Jesus. We love you, we praise you, and we want to 
glorify your name through this time of worship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.